Organic chemistry, here at last we come to the end of the course. Organic chemistry is the chemistry of carbon and carbon's compounds. Now, we need to know some things about carbon before we can understand why organic compounds are the way they are. First of all, because carbon has a configuration of 2-4 and it has four valence electrons, its dot diagram should look like this, which would indicate that it can form two covalent bonds. And often carbon will form two covalent bonds. But in organic compounds, carbon has to reach what's called the sp3 hybridized state. In other words, it's going to have an unpaired s electron and three unpaired p electrons. So carbon, when it forms organic compounds, its dot diagram will look like that and it will form sp3 hybridized bonds. What does that mean? That means that carbon can form four covalent bonds. Four. It's like the ultimate chemistry tinker toy. The reason? It has four unpaired valence electrons when it forms organic compounds. Now remember, a covalent bond is a pair of shared electrons. It's like a handshake. You need one hand from one person and one hand from the other person and then you can shake. You can't form a bond unless electrons are being shared. And a shared pair of electrons is a covalent bond. There's a covalent bond, there's a covalent bond, there's a covalent bond, there's a covalent bond. Now, because we've got carbon in the middle and four atoms around it, the shape of those four covalent bonds is cast your mind back, 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 doo -doo, doo -doo, back to the distant past. Four bonds around a central atom is tetrahedral. You know, four sided. Carbon comes in many different forms, and they're called allotropes. They're all pure carbon, but their molecular arrangement is different, and this gives them different properties. Amorphous, this means without a definite crystal shape. Like this right here. This is coal. Coal is amorphous carbon. It's packed full of energy, which is why we use it as a fuel. Of course, it's kind of a dirty fuel, and digging it out of the ground can really damage the environment, but it's a relatively inexpensive source of energy. And most of the electricity that's generated comes from burning coal. When carbon is in a soft crystalline form, it forms what's called graphite. And graphite, when mixed with clay in certain proportions, gives you what we call the pencil lead. It's not actually lead, it's just carbon, graphite, that's mixed with clay in different proportions. Now the softer the pencil, the less clay and more graphite. And the harder the pencil, the more clay and less graphite. Network crystal. Diamonds are forever! Now there's a group of molecules made purely out of carbon that are called fullerenes. Fullerenes are when you have carbon atoms bonded together to form a closed structure. This is 60 carbon atoms that are arranged in the shape of a soccer ball. We call this Buckminster Fullerene, also known as a buckyball. If you were to take a buckyball and split it in half, have one side over here, the other side over there, and make a tube out of carbon atoms and then connect them at each end with half a buckyball, you'd get what's called a carbon nanotube. Nanotubes are being investigated for their possibility of being used as conductors in extremely small transistor circuits so that you could actually fit the power of your desktop computer into the palm of your hand. Nanotechnology will give us the ability to do that. Now I know we said that metals conduct electricity, but carbon can also conduct electricity under the right conditions. Not as diamond, as network solid, it's out of the question. But nanotubes can conduct electricity and graphite is an outstanding conductor of electricity. Not only is graphite a great conductor of electricity, it's also very non-reactive. In a battery, the positive end of the battery is manganese powder, but you need to have some kind of conductor to go into that manganese powder, well paste actually. So what they use is a graphite rod 
and that graphite conducts electricity. Here are some properties of organic compounds. Well, first of all, there's about 60,000 inorganic compounds, you know, compounds that are made of elements other than carbon, or elements that are made of carbon that aren't organic. For example, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide are not considered to be organic. Neither are carbonate compounds, like calcium carbonate, they're not considered to be organic compounds either. But if you ignore those, there are several million known organic compounds, and the number grows every day as we discover new ones or even synthesize new ones. Organic compounds are generally nonpolar, which means they've got very weak London dispersion forces that barely hold them together, leading to very low melting and boiling points. Most organic compounds, especially small ones, are liquids and gases. Now, the organic solids tend to be very soft, like wax, like earwax. They tend to have high vapor pressure. In fact, they're what's called volatile. They evaporate very quickly. And here's another amazing thing about it. They're flammable. Imagine you've got a liquid that evaporates, turns into a gas, increases its surface area, and it can burn. Oh, joy. This is why they say never go back into your car when you're pumping gas. Because if you're pumping gas and you go back into your car and you get a little, pick up a little static charge from your car's carpet, as you're pumping gas, that gas is actually evaporating and forming vapor cloud. You've smelled it. You pump gas and, ooh, this is terrible. It smells like gas. Well, that's vapor that's building up in the air, mostly butane. And what happens is if you touch your car and there's a spark, you could ignite it. <laughs> Also, it tends to be insoluble in water. Kind of like the whole idea of oil and water don't mix. Why? Because water is polar, and organic compounds generally are nonpolar. There are a couple of slight exceptions to this that we'll get to when we do organic families. Now, what happens during combustion, or the organic reaction, where the organic compound reacts with oxygen? Well, carbon dioxide and water vapor are formed, and lots of heat which is why we use combustion as one of our primary sources of generating heat. Your furnace in your basement burns either oil or natural gas. Or in a power plant, you can burn coal, oil, natural gas, or even biomass. And that produces heat that turns water to steam, that turns a turbine, which turns a generator, and pumps electricity into your house. So combustion was the first discovered reaction. Ooh, me discover fire. Mm, fire warm, fire. Good. The problem with combustion is that when you burn organic compounds, they release a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which has been shown to lead to climate change because of the greenhouse effect. The primary source of organic compounds that we use in synthesis and fuels comes from this stuff. This is crude oil. This is Middle East light crude oil. It comes from, well, the Middle East. This is North Sea crude oil. Again, very light, very, ooh, look at that. It's got a very low viscosity, very small molecules, good for extracting fuel. This is Venezuelan heavy crude. It's thick and tarry. And you can actually extract these molecules from it because when living organisms sink to the bottom of the sea, they decompose in the absence of oxygen because they burn if there's oxygen. And what happens is, as they decompose, they form this tarry goo, which is made of many, many different organic molecules, which combined together is called petroleum, or crude oil.